Ena mana, ena hoefa, tena koto katoa, no mai haere mai, e koe ana te na ko, kua tai mai koto, ki te fokanui i te kopapa o te ra, no mai haere mai, norera, e a ku rangatira, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome. My name is Anna Hood. I'm an international law academic here at um, Auckland Law School, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's public lecture. We're extremely fortunate tonight to have two speakers to address us about an incredibly important topic, and that is the return to power of the Taliban in Afghanistan in August 2021, and in particular, the impact that their return to power had on women judges in Afghanistan. Many women judges were forced to flee the country and to find um, new homes in other parts of the world, including here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I'm going to introduce our two speakers um, together um, so that we've got all the introductions out of the way and I can then allow them to come up and take up um, the rest of the evening. So our first speaker tonight is Justice Susan Glazebrook. Um, Justice Glazebrook is a judge of the Supreme Court of New Zealand and she's the president of the International Association of Women Judges. The International Association of Women Judges, or IAWJ, was heavily involved in um, organising for women judges to leave Afghanistan and to be resettled in countries around the world. So she's going to be sharing tonight her experiences and insights of the process. I'm sure she needs a little introduction, but a bit of information um, about her. Before being appointed to the Supreme Court, Judge Glazebrook, Justice Glazebrook was a partner in a large commercial law firm and a member of various commercial boards and governance advisory committees. Since becoming a judge, she served as a member of the Advisory Council of Jurists for a the Asia Pacific Forum of National Human Rights Institutions, and she's chaired the Institute of Judicial Studies. In 2014, Justice Glazebrook was made a Dane Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to the judiciary, and this year she was awarded Duke University's Bolch Prize for the IAWJ's work in Afghanistan. Our second speaker this evening is Rehana Atta'e. Rehana graduated from the Faculty of Law in Kabul University in 2013. She was then appointed to um, the bench in the criminal court in 2017, where she worked for four years until the Taliban returned to power. At that point, she was forced to flee with her family and she eventually came to New Zealand in December 2021. She's currently studying here at Auckland Law School so that she can qualify to be a legal practitioner here in New Zealand and we're really delighted to have her with us. And tonight she'll be sharing some insights of her experience as one of the women judges that was forced to flee. Just so you're aware, we are filming this evening's um, lecture so that it can be shared with others who couldn't be here tonight. Um, we will hopefully, if we have time, have some questions and answers right at the end of the lecture, but we will turn off the recording for that part so you can feel, um, not feel that you're going to be front and centre and have a camera in your face. Um, so for now, I'd like you to join me in welcoming our first speaker, Justice Glazebrook. Ki te whare wānanga e tū nei e tū. Ki nga mana whenua o tēnei rohe, tēnei tumihi. Ki a koto e hui hui mai nei, Māori a mei, te aroha me te māmai. Ki o tāte mātei. Mō te toko whā hoki i hinga ki Afghanistan. Haere nga mātei, haere atu rā. Tātou te hunga ora, Tēnā koto katoa. As is customary, I've acknowledged the mana whenua of this place and the people who have gone before us, without whom we would not be where we are today. In particular, I acknowledged um, Judge Kadria Yassini and Judge Zakia Harawi, two of my sister judges from Afghanistan who were gunned down and killed on their way to perform their judicial duties in January 2021. Since the Taliban takeover, two more judges have died. 
Soraya Morat, who died in Kabul in unclear circumstances in August last year, and Judge Sarifa Siddiqui, who tragically died of a heart attack in Islamabad in September. Paying respect to those judges is a fitting introduction to my topic today, the efforts to assist the courageous women judges of Afghanistan. I start with a bit of background. First, it's necessary to understand that Afghanistan is not a unified whole. Divisions in the country are regional, tribal, and through the three main ethnic groups, Pashtun, the most numerous, Tajik and Hazara. Second, it is a Muslim country with some 90% of the population following Sunni Islam. Third, it's predominantly a rural country. Around three quarters of the population live in rural areas. And fourth, Afghanistan has a long history of a large proportion of the population living in poverty. To understand Afghanistan's presence, it's all present, it's also necessary to understand its past. Given its location along the Silk Road trading link between East and West, Afghanistan has been strategically important throughout history. It's often been referred to as the graveyard of empires, a reference to the many failed attempts over centuries by different foreign nations to invade and occupying it, going back to Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan. Uh, later, latter day invaders include Britain and the former USSR in the 19th and 20th centuries, and after 9-11, the United States and its Western allies. Many of you probably associate Afghanistan with the repression of women, but there have been periods throughout Afghanistan's history where women have had relative freedom. From 1919 to 1929, for example, girls' schools were opened, child marriages were banned, and women were given the right to choose their own marriage partners. Importantly, women were given voting rights in Afghanistan in 1919, before women in several Western nations, including the United States, France, Italy, Spain, and Switzerland. In 1929, tribal leaders forced to return to Sharia law, but from 1933, reforms started to be reinstituted, and under the 1964 Constitution of Afghanistan, women gained full equality, including full suffrage rights. And in the 1965 election, four women were elected to parliament and two others were elected as senators in the upper house. And the first female judge was appointed in 1969. In the 1960s and 70s, Kabul became known as the Paris of Central Asia. And women in Kabul attended university and were allowed to appear without headscarves and, as you can see, with miniskirts as well, given the times. As you'll be aware, however, very serious restrictions on women were again imposed under the first Taliban regime from 1995. And because of this, after that regime fell, Western-backed reconstruction and modernisation efforts focused heavily on improving the lives of women and girls. And an important part of these efforts was the reform of the justice sector. Laws and policies to address some of the biggest issues faced by Afghan women judges were introduced, including laws and courts dealing with um, domestic violence. And um, one of my colleagues who's here, um, in fact, visited Afghanistan um, and wrote a report for the United Nations in relation to them, Claudia Elliott. So. Um, efforts were also made to increase women's involvement in the legal profession and the judiciary. And by 2013, nearly 20% of lawyers in the country were female, and women constituted some 8% of judges. And uh, just to give you their, their beautiful green robes, um, which they're very proud of, um, but unfortunately had to ditch and hide when the Taliban came. Um, Women working in the justice sector nevertheless did face significant barriers on their careers, um, like women everywhere. 
Um, but what put that apart was that they also face daily threats to their safety from both terrorist attacks and from litigants. And from 2015 to 2020, um, it's estimated that more than 300 judges, prosecutors, prison personnel and other justice sector workers were killed, injured or abducted. And the Taliban are believed to have been behind many of those attacks. Women with high public profiles were particularly targeted in an effort to intimidate not only women holding public office, but women generally. And this was the background to the killing of the two Afghan women judges in January 2021, to whom I paid tribute at the beginning of this talk. Despite the very real dangers they faced, the Afghan women judges continued to dedicate themselves to their jobs and their country. They were motivated by a commitment to justice, the rule of law, and the fair treatment of women in the Afghan legal system. And these women went into work each day, not knowing if they'd return home to their families in the evening. And in doing so, they were truly making a difference to the lives of the women in Afghanistan. Their courage and dedication is beyond belief. The International Association of Women Judges, or IAWJ, of which, um, as Anna said, I'm the current president, has had a long-standing connection with the Afghan women judges and their National Women Judges Association. From 2003 to 2014, the IAWJ ran a cultural and legal exchange program where groups of Afghan women judges came to the United States to spend time in Washington DC and Vermont, um, Vermont being ruled a bit closer to the sort of conditions they had in Afghanistan. Um, but here's a, a group of um, Afghan women judges visiting the US Supreme Court. And you may recognise um, Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sandra Day O'Connor uh, there to greet them. The Afghan women judges that also attended our IAWJ conferences over the years, uh, the latest being in May 2021, when they, uh, I have to say virtually of course, <laughs> attended the biennial conference held in Auckland. Um, and they explained the terrible security conditions they were operating under. And they asked us to help publicise this to the world and also to assist them with educational programmes. And we were only too happy to agree to this. It was very much within the ambit of the IAWJ's usual work. And a small Afghan um, support committee was formed to assist in these efforts. But in August 2021, all changed dramatically. Our committee members watched in horror as the Taliban <laughs> reached Kabul. Uh, we started receiving desperate calls from our Afghan colleagues and friends and refusing help um, was impossible as a matter of integrity despite major humanitarian rescue operations being well outside our training and experience. We knew that the women judges were in serious danger when the Taliban reached Kabul. The idea of women as judges just does not fit with the Taliban view of the world. In addition, many of the women judges sat on courts, such as those focused on countering violence against women and terrorism, that the Taliban viewed as hostile agents of the Western agenda. To make matters worse, the Taliban emptied the prisons of even the worst criminals and terrorists. And many of these offenders had been sentenced by the women judges and were out for revenge. There's also a particularly high risk of revenge attacks from disgruntled family court litigants encouraged by the new regime. Ultimately, the judges had no choice but to go into hiding. They also had to destroy or hide anything that identified them as a judge, um, effectively having to deny their very identity. So just two quick examples of the dangers these judges faced and continue to face, the ones who are still there. Uh, one judge had fled her home with her family when the Taliban took over, fearing they'd come looking for her. She was right. They came, they trashed the house, and shot and killed the family dog. The judge has no doubt that if she'd been there, they would have killed her too. 
Another judge had granted custody of a child to the family of a mother who'd been murdered by her husband. Released from prison by the Taliban, the father phoned the judge, demanding that she tell him where the child was by the next day, or he would kill both the judge and her daughters. The judge and her family had to go into hiding, and you will be relieved to know that both of those judges are now safe, and I think both in Australia. Uh, so what did the IAWJ's rescue efforts entail? Um, our involvement can be split into three stages. The first stage was after the Taliban had taken over Kabul, but while the United States military remained in control of Kabul airport. During this time, the only option was getting the women judges on official military evacuation flights. In light of the obvious, to us at least, and serious dangers the women judges were facing and the very important role they had played in democracy building, we naively presumed that they would be guaranteed a spot on these flights. We couldn't have been more wrong. The old adage, women and children first, did not seem to apply. In fact, women and children seemed to be the lowest on the priority list. We tried everything we could to get the women judges onto the flights. We did countless media interviews to raise awareness. We reached out to governments around the world and prepared endless lists. Um, despite this, only some 30 of the 250 women judges were rescued in this period. And most of the spots were secured on Polish um, military aircraft. This was the result of a tremendous advocacy effort from a particularly tenacious intellectual property lawyer of all things in Poland. Um, and she'd read about the plight of the women judges and contacted us with a help, with an offer of assistance. But even for those judges who were allocated a flight on those um, official evacuation flights, and um, some were also allocated um, positions on um, the flights to the UK, um, actually getting to the airport was another story entirely. Only official vehicles were being let in and out, and that didn't apply mostly to our judges. So what they had to do was make their way to the airport on foot, passing through two armed checkpoints where tear gas was administered, Rifles fired into the air and at one point um, a rifle actually pointed at the husband of one of the judges and people were beaten with plastic hoses. To be fair, a lot of that I think was crowd control but nonetheless frightening, especially if you're there with children. Um, the judges who were able to get through the checkpoints um, still had to battle through a crush of people in searing heat, a crush of desperate people, and with little food and water and through what had effectively become a sewer before reaching the airport gates. And the average time just to get to the airport was some 30 hours. During this time, um, our IAW committee and a small group of translators ran a 24-hour Zoom and WhatsApp group. Our job was to encourage the judges, provide directions, um, including on one memorable occasion through Google Maps, <laughs> and to help liaise with the Polish soldiers on the ground at the airport and the airport authorities and then back with the judges. We all got very little sleep during this time because we were so anxious to ensure that our judges reached the airport gate safely. A lot of them didn't, they had to turn back. Um, by the end of this period I could almost smell um, the sewer. Um, this first phase um, ended at the end of August because on 26 August um, 2021 a suicide bomb effectively um, stopped all of the evacuation flights and you might remember the, the, um, the stories about that. So on to the second stage. The official evacuation flights were at an end and the burden of evacuating the many at risk people still in Afghanistan fell almost entirely on civil society. And to me, it's a matter of great international shame that so many people, and in particular so many women, who'd worked so hard for democracy and human rights in Afghanistan, were effectively abandoned by the authorities in this way. As before, the IAWJ had no choice but to continue to try to help our sister judges escape in any way we could 
and we partnered with several other non-governmental organisations, including the International Bar Association, the International Commission of Jurists Australia, and Jewish Humanitarian Response. And we're immensely grateful for their support. Now, in the second phase, evacuations were mainly undertaken via chartered aircrafts. Um, and this slide shows um, one of the very relieved judges finally leaving Afghanistan on one of those charter flights. Organising the flights was an enormously expensive exercise and a logistical nightmare, and luckily we could rely on our partners for most of that. But it involved securing landing rights in both Afghanistan and in destination countries, working out how to get judges safely to the airport, the flights left, um, um, from a, a place called Mazar Sharif, which is about 10 hours by bus, I think, from Kabul. Um, and, in, and arranging transit destinations, which we learned to call lily pads. We learned a lot of military techno um, terminology during this period. But where judges and their families could wait until visas could be organised to their final destinations. And the two main transit countries for our judges were Greece and the United Arab Emirates. And the judges have... Um, really only recently been moving from there to final destinations and some are still, some 50 of them are still waiting in those transit countries stuck in a very difficult state of limbo. The second stage of evacuations ended with a failed evacuation flight at the end of 2021. Some of our judges and their family members who were manifested for the flight were detained for up to 24 hours by the Taliban before being released. And as you can imagine, it was a terrifying experience for the judges and an, an incredibly anxious 24 hours as well for the IAWJ committee while we waited for news of people detained. So now we're in the third stage. It's no longer possible um, to charter flights out of Afghanistan um, due to the deteriorating situation inside the country and the difficulty in securing appropriate document, documentation. We've got about 50 women judges still in Afghanistan and at risk, and the only option left is to evacuate these women um, via land, one family at a time. It's painstaking. We made, again, very naively, a promise to forget no one, and we intend to do everything we can to keep that promise, um, but Heartbreakingly, it's becoming more and more difficult to achieve. And our judges are facing increasing dangers in Afghanistan. The Taliban have been conducting searches in the main centres. There's been sustained questioning of our judges in the course of these searches, and this has been very, very frightening. So far, they've managed to convince the Taliban in those circumstances that they were at the most very minor civil servants, typists, and that seems to have um, saved them so far. Um, we've also just recently received a communication about a new Taliban edict stating that all of the decisions and sentences of the judges under the previous government are invalid. And this puts the judges who decided those cases in even more danger. And it's likely to have an absolutely devastating effect on women litigants who, for example, had succeeded in getting divorces from violent husbands. In general, the Taliban regime has little respect for the rule of law and human rights, with widespread reports of arbitrary detention, torture, extrajudicial killings, as well as the return of public whipping and stoning and the threat of civil war looms large. Particularly at risk are the Hazara community, a minority ethnic and religious um, Shia Muslim group who have faced persecution for over a century. Since August 2021, at least 16 terrorist attacks have claimed more than 700 Hazara casualties. And one particular serious attack, which um, did make the Western media, was on an education centre where 50 young Hazara women were killed and over 100 wounded in a bomb attack while in a classroom preparing for their university entrance exams. Life generally as a woman in Afghanistan is also becoming more and more difficult. When the Taliban first entered Kabul, they claimed that they were changed. They were a new Taliban and that they would not reinstitute the harsh restrictions on women that existed in the regime in the 1990s. We were highly sceptical, and unfortunately, we've been proved right. 
The Ministry for Women has been replaced by the Ministry of Vice and Virtue, tasked with imposing restrictions on women's rights. Girls have been banned from secondary schools and universities. Women are not allowed to drive, can't travel more than 72 kilometres without a male chaperone, have been banned from gyms and parks, and have effectively been told not to leave their homes unless absolutely necessary. When they are in public, they must wear full body and face coverings. They now have very few opportunities to earn a living and have been banned from certain career paths, for example. They're no longer permitted to work for NGOs and more recently not permitted to work for the United Nations. The UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Afghanistan has said that the Taliban's policy on women is a crime against humanity with gender persecution, um, in his view, constituting an, constituting an international crime under the Rome Statute. And he's called on the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to consider the situation. And as if all this was not bad enough, the people of Afghanistan are also suffering because of natural disasters and the dire economic situation. Extreme poverty is facing families to make desperate choices in an effort to beat off starvation, including sending children as young as three or four to work and selling their young daughters into marriage in exchange for dowries. All of this makes it even more imperative to evacuate the women judges from Afghanistan as soon as possible. However, helping the judges escape Afghanistan is just the first step. Once they cross the border into neighbouring countries, they face a wait of up to two years for visas to final destination countries, and we hope mostly the United States. As you can imagine, though, life in limbo is not easy, particularly for the children, and there's also the constant threat of being deported back to Afghanistan. When they reach final destination countries, they still face a significant uphill battle. Obviously, there's an amazing sense of relief to reach safely, safety, and especially for families with daughters. And this is a, a picnic at Mission Bay um, when some of the judges had first arrived in New Zealand, and you can imagine it was a very happy occasion. Uh, but these judges have lost the careers that they worked so hard for, and have become refugees in countries where they don't speak the language, or at least not well. They will face years of hardship and retraining, and many are seriously traumatised. Most are also desperately worried about family members and colleagues left behind in Afghanistan. They are, however, determined women, and will no doubt eventually make a huge contribution to the countries they now call home. And hopefully, one day, they'll be able to celebrate the return of the rule of law to Afghanistan. Um, finding permanent home countries for the judges has not been an easy task, however, and one particular difficulty is that the Afghan concept of family is much broader than in most Western countries. But of course, the Afghan definition of family is shared by the Taliban, and if the Taliban can't find the judge, they will target the family, so the whole family is in fact in danger. Uh, we are incredibly grateful for the countries that have agreed to grant permanent visas to our women judges. And in many cases, um, they have recognised um, and extended their idea of family to include some extended family members. Um, the countries where the judges are include Australia, the United Kingdom, Germany, Spain, Ireland, Canada and the United States. So we now have some 150 um, judges and their families resettled in final destination. And I'm happy to say that six of these are in New Zealand. Um, and here are some of the resettled judges at a reception um, hosted by the Governor General. And you can see Rahana um, gave her first public speech in English, I think, on that, um, on that occasion. Um, I should stress that we're very conscious that there are other groups at risk in Afghanistan and also in other countries. Um, but we are a very small group of volunteers and we just can't help everyone. We're a women judges group and we did feel an obligation to our sister judges, particularly because of our history with them as long-term members of the IAWJ. 
I thought I'd finish by briefly mentioning some of the lessons we've learned throughout this experience. First, the power of modern communication, including encryption and translation apps, which have enabled us to keep in contact with the Afghan women judges safely so far, again at least. There have nevertheless been some amusing mistranslations that have required some clever skills of deduction to decode. We do have translators, but it doesn't always work as well. Um, one particularly memorable instance involved one of the judges writing to me, Hello, Mrs. Susan. I hope the health of your intruder apples. <laughs> I'm still not quite sure exactly what she meant to say, but I think it's safe to assume that her wishes of good health uh, were directed at me rather than any potential intruder. <laughs> the second lesson is the power of information. Uh, we have a very extensive database that we gathered right in the early stages. So we've got full access um, um, to information on all of our judges that can be provided both to those helping with national um, with evacuations and also to national authorities in respect of visas. And that's proved invaluable for the endless lists we've been required to provide. No one can possibly have a list in the same form as the last person, and they always deny having received any list the next time they ask you for one. Uh, third, the importance of international networks to coordinate efforts, including our IAWJ network around the world, um, Jewish humanitarian response, um, again, and they continue to support our um, committee and our judges. They've been a tremendous partner to have. And we've also had a network of pro bono lawyers um, throughout the world who've been helping with immigration issues. Um, the fourth lesson is one um, our Canadian committee member, Justice Mona Lynch, um, um, came up with, and she was describing our early 24-hour Zoom days. And it is never to underestimate the power of a determined old uh, power of a group of determined old women in their pajamas. <laughs> um, but seriously, the final lesson relates to both the importance of, but also the fragility of the rule of law. It can be compromised suddenly and completely, as in Afghanistan. But it can also be compromised by stealth and by stages. And we must be ever vigilant and protective. And I'd like to end with a tribute to my Afghan colleagues. Their resilience, bravery, and determination has been truly awe-inspiring. Awe it is the Afghan women judges who are the true heroines of this story. Thank you. Tena koto kotoa and good evening. Uh, thank you so much, Justice Susan, for your insights about Afghanistan, about the history, and about the bad situation that people are facing now, especially the women. I acknowledge that if we didn't have the support of IAWJ, uh, for me, I don't know now, it, was, uh, it is obvious that I was not here. Maybe I was killed by Taliban or a freed prisoner or I was inside the four walls of the home suffering from the loss of everything, including freedom, career, and also financial uh, challenges. To begin, uh, in order to be a judge in Afghanistan, you have to be graduated from law school, you have to sit a national exam, and then after two years of judicial training, you can be a judge. So it is much uh, shorter and easier than in New Zealand. Uh, I was appointed as a judge in 2017, and I started my work with a criminal, law, a criminal court uh, called the Court on Elimination of Violence Against Women. It was special courts uh, established all around Afghanistan to review the cases related to violation against women, uh, from the family violation to the social violation. And it was very significant courts because anyone who, viola who violated women, they were sure that there is a court that can reach the case. Uh, unfortunately, now there is none of them because Taliban removed all uh, I worked three years uh, on that court in Herat province. Herat is located uh, close to Iran. And it is a province much uh, conservative than Kabul, but more open than many other provinces of Afghanistan. 
In 2019, uh, the Afghanistan Supreme Court announced that there is a dire need for women judges to move to those provinces that there is no woman judge. The reason that in some provinces of Afghanistan there was no woman judge was that the security challenges were very high even on that time. And also the society was very conservative that women couldn't work. Many of them didn't allow the women to work on the government or outside. On that time, I thought with myself that if I stay in Herat, I cannot be as much uh, significant, uh, I cannot do as much significant work as I can do in a province that there is no woman judge. And I decided to move to Nangarhar province. Nangarhar is located close to Pakistan, and it is a very, very, very conservative, especially about women. On that province, you couldn't see women with no, you <coughs> couldn't see women face even. They are covered up. And I moved to Nangarhar with my husband and child. The first day of my work there, my colleagues told that we don't think that you made a good decision because we are sure that you cannot continue your job here. Uh, you will face a lot of security challenges because ISIS and Taliban are very uh, active on that province and also uh, people may not accept you because you are a woman. The people don't accept women judge here. You are young. And most important, you are Hazara, you are Shia, all the people here, they are Pashtun, they speak Pashto, you speak Farsi, and all these challenges. I told them that I will continue my work here, but if I understand that I can't continue, I will live by, my own, by myself. After some uh, weeks of working, they understood that how important it is to have a woman judge in the court, especially in the court on elimination of violence against women. Because on that court, the women, when the women come to the uh, trial, they didn't speak. It was men who spoke on behalf of them. And you couldn't see the face. You didn't know that is it the real person or anyone else. And they didn't show their face to the men. During, uh, during the tri uh, trials, I asked them to show their face, to speak about uh, their problems and they gradually started to speak. And after some months, it was normal to speak in the court. And the women were happy because of having a woman judge in the court. I was happy because of that decision that I made and moved to that province, although it was very challenging for me. During one year, I, just, I never went to a park or a restaurant or even to shopping. My house was located inside the court campus, and I just went to my work and come back to home. Uh, sometimes I just thought that is the police in front of the door, is it an enemy or is it really protect us? Because you couldn't trust anyone on that time. And the security challenges was getting worse day by day. The Qatar peace negotiation was going in the favor of Taliban. The media, including national and inter international media, they talk in favor of Taliban. They told that Taliban changed. They, they are not going to restrict women anymore, as Susan said. And also, there was many shots on the gov uh, government staff all around that Nangarhar province. One thing we were sure about, that Taliban never come to take the power. We couldn't believe that. But in August, it, can, it, it was real. The US soldiers left Afghanistan, and uh, the province of Afghanistan uh, came to the, uh, went to the Taliban hand af one after another. During nine days, Taliban took all the province of Afghanistan. It, it was night. I was sleeping in my house in Nangarhar. I received a call from my colleague. He told me that leave your house now because Taliban is already on the city and they are coming to take the control of the court. I didn't know where to go and how to go because I had a small, ch a small child. Uh, we just got out of, of the home and we didn't have anyone in Nangarhar to go to their house. We went to 
uh, our, uh, my colleague and by the, their help we moved to Kabul. During the way, um, I, could, I just uh, cried because I saw just Taliban, they were is, is stood on the streets proudly with their guns and people were hopeless. They were, they were fearful. In Kabul, the people were just flying to the airport uh, and many of them, they didn't know what to do. I went to my mother-in-law house and I stayed there. After some days, I received a phone call. Uh, he treated me and said, do you remember me? He was speaking Pashto. Uh, I said no, he said that uh, you put me in prison and now I am free, I am powerful, I can find you. I remembered him, he was a, Talib, a young Talib member who killed his wife very badly. His wife was young and he killed him, her with, because of no reason, just because she had a phone with her. And we sentenced him for 20 years in jail. On the uh, trial day, he said that one day I, I will come out of prison. And now he was out. I asked him where you got my details. He said, from the court, I have all the, your documents. And after that, I left the house of my mother-in-law and went to the house of my father, to brothers. I changed my address many times. But uh, I was in contact with my colleagues, with other women. I couldn't keep silent. I started to talk on the media. And one of those medias, they released my real name and also the court that I was worked in their news. Although I asked many, um, in many interviews to not release my name, but I don't know how it happened. That made the uh, things more worse for me. And the good thing was that uh, the IAWJ got in contact with us and they said that we are going to risk, uh, rescue you. We are trying to do that. I personally couldn't believe that because it seemed impossible. There was countries who, who couldn't take their people and troops out of Afghanistan. We thought that how an organization can do it. But they were in uh, regular contact with us, with a WhatsApp group, and we filled many, many forms from different countries to receive visa, but during those times, no country issued visa for us. After that interview, uh, uh, I got a phone call from the, head, uh, from the head of the Nangarhar court. He was a Talib and he said that you spoke about our, against our government. And it was another threat. I, on that time, the things were the worst for me. I left all the addresses that I were. I went to uh, a remote site and the only address that I could ask for help it was again IAWJ. I left for Susan a message and said the situation that things are going worse. And after some hours, uh, I received an email from IAWJ saying that we are going to help you to move to the safe house. And after some hours, uh, they helped us to move to the safe house. And, it, and that was the happiest part of that time because Finally, I could feel safe and could feel secure. I was very worried about my child and also about my family. Sometimes I was regretting because even being a, a mother. And after being 20 days in that safe house, uh, we moved from Kabul to Mazar. Uh, everything was arranged by IAWJ. And after being two days in Mazar, uh, finally we were on the uh, airport and on the plane. In the plane when I thought about leaving Afghanistan, it was, I was happy because of the future of myself, the future of my uh, child, but I felt sorry about my land, about the people, about everything that we tried hard, hard for but feel lost easily. I felt very sorry about my parents that even I couldn't meet them when I left Afghanistan. 
we went to Greece, and in Greece there was a lot of volunteers helped us to, re, uh, to settle in the hotels. And in Greece I understood that how important it is to work for human beings, to help each other, to think widely, not, not just within our country. There are a lot of people all around the world that really need our help. And then after being two years, two months in uh, Greece, uh, I, uh, we received the visa of New Zealand. And the good part was that uh, my extended family members, my, uh, uh, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law, they was lived in Afghanistan from my husband's family, but they were the only two women that lived there. And we were very worried about them because it was hard for them to continue there by their own. And uh, New, New Zealand issued for those two visa as well. It was unbelievable, but it was, it, it happened. Finally, we moved here, and uh, during this one year, we received a lot of support from New Zealand women just here, and, and now I'm resettled. I started my studies at the law school here, and feeling happy, but all the time, uh, even I am physical safe, but uh, when I think about my home country, I suffer with all those women who are regret, uh, who are prohibited from their basic words, and with those girls who cannot go to school or universities. It is very sad, and the saddest part is that uh, there is no clear plan for the future of Afghanistan. No one doesn't know for how long Taliban continue like this, for how long women are restrict, uh, prohibited from their basic rights like this. And it is sad. <laughs> Thank you.